The ninth video on second order responses looks at oscillation and overshoot. A reminder then, we're looking at second order models of this type of form, d2x dt squared plus 2z to omega n dx dt plus omega n squared x equals f. And we're asking ourselves how the behaviour of this system depends upon the parameters such as the damping zeta and the natural frequency omega n. Now earlier videos showed that small damping implies oscillation and slow decay and this video is going to look at that in more detail and in particular look at the oscillation and the overshoot. We're going to assume that the natural frequency is fixed um, because that allows us to get better insights. So how does overshoot and oscillation depend upon the system parameters for an underdamped system? Before we can do this, we need to find a general solution for this differential equation. And once we've found the solution, we can then go back into that and identify the overshoot. Now the question is only well defined if you fix the scenario. So we're going to take zero initial conditions. As soon as you start messing around with the initial conditions, then your answer will depend a little bit upon those. However, what will not depend upon the initial conditions is the general principles of the oscillation frequency and the ratio of peaks or the decay rates. Students are unlikely to be asked to derive these results in an exam, but it's worthwhile going through this because if you can do it, then you've got the skills when you need them. First then, what's the frequency of oscillation? So the characteristic equation is summarized here. And you remember in the previous videos, we said, okay, the roots of this are given by P equals minus zeta omega n plus or minus J omega n root one minus zeta squared. So I hope it's obvious that the frequency of oscillation is given by this bit here, omega D equals omega n root one minus zeta squared. And obviously to have oscillation, we're assuming that damping is less than one. As damping approaches 1, then this frequency omega d is going to approach 0 because root 1 minus theta squared will become small. As the damping ratio approaches 0, this frequency is going to tend to the natural frequency. And you're reminded that the natural frequency omega n is the frequency of oscillation you would get if there was no damping at all. Let's look at the general solution then for this second order differential equation with zero initial conditions. And you'll note, for convenience, we've set the right hand side to be the same as the coefficient of the x so that the steady state is 1. You don't have to do that, but it just makes the algebra a little bit easier. So first of all, let's work out the steady state. So in steady state, I'm only solving this bit here, and therefore fairly clearly I'm going to get x equals 1 is the steady state. Obviously, we're assuming that the uh, signals x of t are convergent. What about the dynamic part? Well, the dynamic part is going to have an exponential e to the minus theta omega nt. That was the real part of the pole. And a sine omega dt plus theta. And omega d we've already defined as omega n root 1 minus theta squared. So if I put those two bits together, this is my overall solution. Now you'll notice I've done something you might think of it as, uh, as naughty. It's not really. I've changed the sign of A. You'll notice I put a minus sign in there. That's for the convenience of the algebra that is to follow. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. You can put plus A. Obviously the sign, any sign changes will be absorbed in the solution you come up with for A. Next, I've differentiated this because I know I'm going to need the derivative. So you get a e to the minus zeta omega nt into minus omega d cos omega dt plus phi plus zeta omega n sine omega dt plus phi. First then, let's substitute in the initial condition x of 0 equals 0, which goes into this equation here. And what you find is e to the minus zeta omega nt is 1 sine omega dt plus phi just becomes sine phi, so you get left with this. 0 equals 1 minus a sine phi. Next, let's substitute in the initial condition for the derivative, x dot of 0 equals 0. And we do that, and you notice we get this equation here. Minus omega d, d minus omega d cos phi plus theta omega n sine phi equals 0. Now, I'm going to start 
by using this second expression. If you remember looking at the solutions of the ODEs we did in an earlier video, we have done this um, already. So if I separate out the sine phi and the cos phi, as I've done here, then I will end up with this expression. Tan phi equals omega d over zeta omega n. But you'll remember we know what omega d is. If I just remind you here, omega d equals omega n into the root of 1 minus zeta squared. So if I substitute that in, I end up with tan phi is this expression here, root 1 minus zeta squared over zeta. Now once I've got tan phi, I can of course get sine phi. And I've written it down here for you. I'll let you prove it to yourself. Sine phi is therefore root 1 minus zeta squared. And then I go back and I look at this expression I had here, where I said 0 equals 1 minus a sine phi. So I can now solve for a as 1 over sine phi, which is 1 over the root 1 minus zeta squared. So putting all that together, here is my general solution. OK, so zero initial conditions. I've used the uh, normalized form with damping ratio and natural frequency. And you'll notice it, the solution is expressed entirely in terms of the damping ratio zeta and the natural frequency omega n. So I can now substitute in whatever zeta and omega n I want into this formula to get the solution I need. Now, we want to look at overshoot. We want to say, OK, if it's underdamped, how far am I going to overshoot? in a step response. So I've already said that this is the general form of the solution. Now you'll notice here I've just left it in terms of a and phi because it's easier to carry the algebra. I'll put in the actual value for a and phi later when I need them. We've already done the derivative. That was on the previous slide. So if we want to find the peak overshoot, we're going to be doing things like setting the derivative equal to zero because the peak over that, at an overshoot point, the uh, derivative will be zero. Now, what else have I done? As I've gone from here to here, I've used a formula that says I can add a sine and a cosine together to give just a single sine or just a single cosine. So you'll notice because they have the same frequency and the same thing in the same argument, so it's cos of omega dt plus phi or sine of omega dt plus phi, then adding these two together gives me a sine omega dt plus phi plus some phase shift and there's a corresponding constant b which takes into account what was the magnitude on the cos and what was the magnitude on the sine. Now that's a standard mathematical formula. If you're not familiar with it, I suggest you look it up in your maths textbooks. So what comes next? Well, I've told you here, just in case you need to know, this is what you get for b. You'll see it's a very simple dependence on the original uh, coefficients of the cosine and the sine. This is theta. And again, you'll get that formula straight out of your maths books. But the most interesting thing when you actually calculate this theta is what I've put here. You'll notice it's the negative of phi. OK, if you go back a couple of slides and look at how we define phi, you'll see the definition for theta here is actually the negative of phi. And then you look at this formula here and say, just a minute, in dx dt, I've got phi plus theta. But if they're the negative of each other, they are going to cancel. And so this is what we get. dx dt equals 0 will imply that this sign is 0, but because those two cancel, that means that omega dt has got to be n pi. Those two have cancelled. So I will get a maximum or a minimum in my curve at times where omega dt equals n pi. And you notice it's a very neat and simple formula, which is quite convenient. So peak overshoot times are given by this formula here. And you can you can put in n equals 0. That will obviously be the initial time. So it tells you the gradient is 0 when you start. 1 will give you the first overshoot. 2 will give you the first undershoot. 3 will give you the second overshoot, and so on. So you put in the values of n that you want. The next question then is, OK, I know what time the overshoot occurs at. Can I use this to find how big the overshoot is? So what I've got to do now is take this time and put it into this formula. So that's what I'm doing here. And you'll notice I'm going to use the first peak 
um, because that's usually where the overshoot is the biggest. So I'm going to use n equals 1. So if I do n equals 1, what that tells me is that p equals pi over omega d. And if you put that formula in there, you'll see that the omega d's are going to cancel, which is why I've suddenly got n pi plus phi. And people hopefully will realize that sine of pi plus phi equals sine of minus phi. Again, that's a standard trigonometric identity. So what we've got is at the first peak, this is the value of x of t. Now, I've not put t into the exponential yet. I'm going to do that next. So what have we got? The exponential, <coughs> well, sorry, first we'll do this bit. Um, we've got a multiplier by a sine minus phi. Now, again, if you go back about two slides, you'll remember that we told you that a sine minus phi equals minus 1. So rather than substituting in a and substituting in sine phi, I'll just put minus 1 in straight away. And therefore, I get this, x of t equals 1 plus e to the minus zeta omega n t. And now finally, what I'm going to do is look at what's omega n t. Well, I know what t is. It's pi over omega d. So I'm going to end up with this formula, pi omega n over omega d. I know what omega d was. And again, perhaps if I just remind you, in case you've forgotten, that omega d equals omega n into the root 1 minus zeta squared. So when I do that, the omega n's cancel, and I end up with omega n t equals this. So I'm going to put this formula in here, and this is what I get. So we'll go to the next page, because that will summarize the key result. Oh, sorry, no, it doesn't. The key result is um, it's emphasized here. The key result is the value of the peak overshoot depends only on the damping ratio. Look at this formula in the bottom left-hand corner, this formula here. You'll see x of t at the first overshoot is 1 plus e to the minus zeta pi over root 1 minus zeta squared. There's no omega n in there. It depends only on zeta. Now, why is that quite powerful? This slide gives an illustration. I've given one differential equation down here, d2x dt squared plus 2dx dt plus x equals 1, and then alongside it, a differential equation which looks very, very different. OK, it's got a 4dx dt plus a 16x. I've made sure they've both got the same steady state gain to make life easy. But the key thing is, these have both got the same damping. They've both got a damping of 0 0.5, and therefore, when you do the step response, what do you notice? They have the same overshoot. And that's a very, very insightful and useful observation. The overshoot depends only on the damping. OK, the overshoot times are different because they've got different parameters. The settling times are different because they've got different parameters. But the magnitude of the overshoot is the same. And often, the magnitude of the overshoot is a, really, is a key property that you need to know about. Now. We can actually do a sketch which shows you how the overshoot changes, therefore, as you change the damping ratio. So what do you notice? If the damping ratio is 1, which is critical damping, you have no overshoot. And as the damping ratio goes um, smaller and smaller, the overshoot increases. So what sort of overshoot are you prepared to live with? If you said, I can live with 10% overshoot, you can draw that line, and therefore that tells you you can go with a damping of something like 0.6 or greater. If you want the overshoot to be very small, you might be saying, I need the damping to be 0.8 or greater. But you can also see how big the overshoot can get. As the damping gets very, very small, the maximum overshoot is going to be of the order of 1 or 100%. What about the decay rate from one peak to the next? Well, we can easily do this. We're not going to do it um, slowly, because you can go back and look at the algebra yourself. If the first overshoot was given by this, then the next overshoot is going to be at a time which is three times as long. You can easily look at the formula to see that. And therefore, we've put a 3 in here. The third overshoot is going to be at a time five times as long. So you can actually calculate these values very, very quickly if you need them. Alternatively, you could say, what's the ratio of one overshoot to the next overshoot? And here's the formula, and you notice you have an e to the minus zeta 2 pi. 
over root 1 minus theta squared. So here's an example. Let the damping ratio be 0 0.07, which is very small, and you'll see the first overshoot is 80%. Or in other words, if you put zeta equals 0 0.07 into this formula here, you will get an answer of 0 0.8. So what we're finding is the decay rate per peak is going to be 0 0.8 squared. So you get the first overshoot is 0 0.8, and then you'll find you, you're basically multiplying that twice in order to get the ratio of the peaks. So the ratio between peaks is going to be 0 0.64. So in other words, if I want to find um, one peak and the next peak and so on, you see first peak 1.8, so that's 1 plus 0 0.8. Next peak 1 plus 0 0.8 cubed. Next peak 1 plus 0 0.8 to the 5 and so on. And indeed, if I wanted the undershoots, so it is oscillating, then you'd find the undershoots, you'd get things like 1 minus 0 0.8 squared, or 1 minus 0 0.8 to the 4, and so on. Um, the same sort of insights. So let's have a look at this. Here's the plot. And what do you notice? 80% overshoot for the first one. And then this distance here will be 0 0.8 cubed. And this distance here will be 0 0.8 to the 5. And this distance here, if you wanted it, would be 0 0.8 to the 7. And then if you wanted the undershoots, this distance would be 0 0.8 squared. This distance would be 0 0.8 to the 4, and so on. Now, we have told you earlier that typical guidelines suggest a damping ratio of around 0 0.7. And if you look back a couple of slides where we calculated the overshoot for that sort of damping ratio, this is what you would have found. You'd have found that the overshoot is about 4%, or 0 0.04. So you'll notice I've plotted a sketch here with a damping ratio of 0 0.07. Here's the, here's the plot. And what do you notice? The overshoot is about 4%. Now, the interesting thing is by having a damping ratio of 0 0.7, you have a faster rise time. Because there's slightly less damping, there's less resistance to movement, so the system responds just a little bit quicker. Now, I should emphasize it doesn't settle quicker. You could probably prove it settles very slightly slower. But the difference in settling time is minimal, but what you do get is a significant benefit in rise time. So if you look at the rise time for the underdamp system, it's around here, around 2, whereas the equivalent rise time for the other system is quite a lot slower. So that's why people might go for a slightly underdamped system in general, because you get just that slightly faster rise time. A summary of the key formula that you will need um, is here, so you can take a copy of the notes if you want them. So there's the formula for the overshoot, e to the minus zeta pi over root 1 minus zeta squared. If you want the ratio of, of consecutive overshoots, you're basically squaring that. The peak overshoot time comes from pi over omega d, or pi over omega n times root minus 1 minus zeta squared. And if you want the full formula for the response, there it is at the bottom. Now, sometimes <coughs> you'll be asked for this term called logarithmic decrement. And this is defined as the log of overshoot at the n minus once overshoot divided by overshoot at n. And what you will find is that's log of this term here e to the zeta 2 pi over root 1 minus zeta squared. Or in other words, you're getting rid of the log and the exponential, and it's this value in here. So conclusions. We focused on the normal form of second order ODEs in terms of damping ratio and natural frequency. And we've shown that the overshoot for zero initial conditions can be computed and has a very simple analytic formula. The times between peaks and the time for the first peak also has a simple analytic formula. And finally, we've indicated that damping ratio of around 0.7 or larger is usually enough to keep the overshoot to reasonable levels.